Thank you. Um, I'm, going not to talk, I'm not going to talk about tax havens. I'm not going to talk about anything to do with that, but I'm actually going to talk about my learning experience of getting into uh, the tax theories and uh, your domain. So I'm fairly new to this. Luckily, I had co-authors uh, Sam, Corbena, and Evaristo, who's not new to this. Uh, but the reason why I started looking at this is actually I can start with an anecdote. It's uh, because my father, he owned a company, and he had a lot of employees in this company. And at that time, when he actually negotiated wages with, uh, with his employees, he actually did what you call an ad hoc type of negotiation. Because there were different tax brackets in the Danish tax system, and he wanted to say it's also beneficial for you to stay under this tax bracket because then you're taxed a little bit lower and I will benefit as well from this. And because of this, I will give you some of the services that my uh, company can provide, for example, a car free of use, we don't have to record it and so forth. In that sense, it gives you an idea of why I have looked at this, that the differential bunching impacts across uh, the income distribution because the idea basically comes from this. Of course, a lot of people have done this, and I have to say it's not as innovative, this paper. It's more my learning experience, I would say, than the two previous uh, presentations. The unique part here is that we are using, I think, more or less for the first time, the Sambian tax admin data for more or less any anal analysis of this sort. So that is the new part of the paper. So given that I'm new, I could also read the, uh, the articles with a little bit more skepticism than uh, just citing authors that most of you will know that I didn't know, and I could also be may maybe a little bit more critical. For, because the first question I actually asked was related to domestic resource mobilization. There was all of these cool methods, econometrics, very hardcore in the end, a lot of identification assumptions, causality claims and so forth in the papers, but in the end they didn't talk a lot about the magnitude of the effect. And then I've, I came to think about my anecdote again. How much did it actually matter that my dad paid just below the tax bracket? How much is the aggregate effect of this? And in my mind, it cannot be that large. Even though the papers are really looking into this, this was my main reason for going into this, so the domestic resource mobilization. So how big distortions does it actually create to tax collection in that sense? It could change uh, yeah, or trigger real economic responses, affect labor supply. It could also give rise to illicit behavior in form of reporting responses. And my claim is that the first one would be huge effects, whereas the second one may be more limited in terms of the impact. There's a lot of literature uh, on this, using taxpayer data to uh, analyze this, and m the most important papers and contribution is uh, Emmanuel Saez and uh, Henrik Kleven, I think uh, some of the papers, and of course, Chetty and uh, Corpus. Um, important to know is that the pay as you earn income tax in uh, Zambia is a graduated uh, system where tax liability increases progressively uh, in, and each uh, bracket is associated with a fixed marginal tax rate. So we have this discontinuity and that is what we are going to exploit in the analysis. If we look method, uh, in terms of the methodology, we are basically borrowing a lot of the methods from Cleveland and Vasim and the recent paper by Bell in South Africa. So we analyze uh, behavioral responses to discontinuous jumps in the personal income tax rate accounting for issues related to reference point problems. And some of these uh, round number problems that we are also facing, we will basically also correct for that according to the literature. What we know is that this may drive a wedge between the structural elasticities and the observed elasticity that is estimated and that is due um, the first ones to show this was Cleveland and Wasim in the case of Pakistan. We also know that reference point effects amplify bunching and it may overstate the true elasticity. Okay, so this is our point of departure. I will not have time 
for the literature as all the other authors as well. But there is a lot of literature on this, even in developing countries. We have papers in South Africa, Uruguay, China, Mexico, and so forth. And the important lesson here is that they are finding, finding more or less complete opposite results of bunching. And very few of them are actually telling us anything about the combined effect or the magnitude, the aggregate effect. So what I learned is that in order to be taken seriously in this literature, I needed to combine all of these methods. So I actually have learned quite a lot during the last year or so. Uh, I've worked in development many years, but not in this uh, domain. So we are basically taking into account the distinction between kinks and notches. We are basically taking into account reference points and number preferences. We are also distinguishing between wage earners and self-employed. That turned out to be quite a substantial difference in the literature, whether you consider one or the other with different results in different countries, again, I have to say. And then we also need to distinguish between what is behavior and real responses because that is going to affect the magnitude. And the reason why I think a lot of papers are not discussing this much is because I will show you that it's not impressive at least what we find in terms of magnitude. So we applied these bunching approaches to tax admin data over the period 2014 to 21. And I will give you the results that we find significant evidence of excess bunching uh, at the first kink of this tax schedule in uh, Zambia. And we also find a limited evidence in the second kink of the tax schedule, but not a lot or not significant evidence at the third kink. We cannot find bunching. We find a lot, it's important in the Zambian case at least to correct for uh, uh, round number bunching, so that is actually also reducing these elasticities quite heavily. This is just to give you a picture about uh, how uh, the tax schedule looks in uh, Zambia and how it changed over time, uh, just to keep it uh, very simple. And these are basically the bunching estimates uh, and the counterfactual distributions where we have the distance from the kink at the zero level. Okay, so very standard. According to the literature, there's no new things to report in terms of methodology. The round number bunching, I have to say, appears to be very time dependent, and I cannot explain that. I don't have an explanation for this today. I don't know enough about Zambia. I'm talking to my Zambian colleagues about this, but we are finding, finding much more or the largest round, bunching, uh, round number bunching in 2021 as compared to 2016. So what is the reason for this result that we're actually seeing changing responses to round number bunching over time? According to the literature, that should be constant. So what is going on? Is it a data mistake? I cannot tell you today, we're working on that. So what are the results that we get in Zambia? We actually get results that are in line with uh, papers in South Africa, where observed bunching reacts sharply and immediately to changes in the location of the kink points. You saw we had changes in the kink points. Immediate changes that could suggest that there is a behavioral response. Real responses would result in a more scattered response around the king point than we observe generally. We do observe it, but we would have expected to have larger effects. Moreover, real responses require adjustments along different dimensions, which may require more time. So we also would see maybe a more gradual response over time. Adjustment of, for example, working hours will take time and will not have an immediate response. It will depend on the contract, given that we are observing formal sector workers, okay? Reporting responses may uh, are less detrimental to welfare, as is shown in some papers, compared to economic responses, so we should take into account these aspects. Results differ heavily from the Bell paper, that is also from South Africa, 
They find that the largest uh, bunching responses are at the high kinks. We find it at the low kinks. Is it something to do with the difference in behavior in South Africa and Zambia? Maybe, but it could also be that the, what do you call it, the real income that you have in Zambia where you're taxed is actually at a higher level that is comparable to the high kinks in the South African case that we are looking into as well. They also find evidence for bunching among the self-employed workers and not for wage workers. We find it significantly for wage workers. Luckily, our uh, results are consistent with recent evidence taking into account reference point uh, problems as we do, and therefore we actually believe that our results are a little bit robust to this. Consistent with the Mexican paper or the Bachas and Soto paper, we find that the re behavioral response to the kinks is driven by reporting responses. And that's the important point here. That means that I would expect low impact on the rest, uh, domestic resource mobilization because it's not a real response. Good. Now we are working on the counterfactual distributions, trying to estimate the loss in, uh, in tax, taxes collected given the counterfactual distribution, comparing it to the individuals around the bunching, moving them to where they should have been in the counterfactual distribution, and then just trying to calculate the overall impact on collected taxes. We are working on this, working on different methods on doing this because there are at least eight different ways of doing this. We have only done twi uh, two until now. So how big is the mix, mis, uh, missed tax revenue arising for this excess sponging? How big or oh, important is it in the Zambian case at least? where we have reporting biases, you can say, and not so much real effects. So we do these simple calculations, and we actually find that the missed revenue can be estimated to a roughly 26 million um, kasha, and that is only about 0.25% of the total uh, taxes collected from the pay-as-you-earn schedule. So limited effect. What we're doing now is trying to redo all of the other papers and cal calculating the impact that they get because they do not report it. But I bet you it will be low, the domestic resource mobilization effects of these kinks. So I will be a little bit strict now to all of the other authors as well. When we are talking about domestic resource mobilization, maybe these kinks are not that important in the tax schedule. Thank you.